I thought that it was going to be some sweet film about these kids trying to make a movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I was going to like capture that, you know? Yeah. But it became so much bigger than that. Hey, I'm Kim Taylor Bennett, and welcome to this episode of Vice Talks Film. Today we're joined by director Crystal Moselle, whose film The Wolf Pack won the U.S. Documentary Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. I always, like, metaphorically described our childhood as, uh, like, him being the uh, landowner and us the people who work on the land. My parents didn't encourage us to communicate with society, so we were kind of shut off. Always lived in this apartment. In the summer, there was more chance of us getting out. Sometimes we go out once a year. This is like 3D, man. It's very fresh out here. here. And at one particular year, we never got out at all. So movies opened up another world. If I didn't have movies, life would be pretty boring. <laughs> this outfit is made out of cereal boxes and yoga mats. We didn't make any friends. We were homeschooled. I did everything I could to escape my world. We kind of thought, why don't we do those films? It makes me feel like I'm living, sort of, because it's kind of magical. I remember being very scared of going out into the world. He thinks there's somebody following us. I guarantee there's somebody following me. My father, his system was just like a ticking bomb. What did he expect when all of us become of age, we're still going to do things his way? I don't think our father knew we had it in us. I guess he always saw us as the little boys who couldn't. And then we transformed into the boys who can. Hi, Crystal. Thanks for joining us. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. So it's kind of crazy because actually the first time I heard about this film was uh, through a friend back in 2011 who told me the brief synopsis of it and said, you should go talk to Crystal. And I went over to your apartment and you told me all about it. And I was like, my mind was blown even then. And you were what, six months into filming at that point? Um, I think it was like about like a year almost. Okay. I remember I was like, yeah, we can, we can do this next year yeah. when it's finished. <laughs> It'll totally be out in 12 months yeah. time. Five, five years. Five years later. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> but one of the stories that I loved when you told me at the time was just you seeing them kind of strolling through the East Village on First Avenue and just being like startled by what they looked like and being compelled to like run after them. Yeah, I was walking down First Avenue in New York City and one of the kids, he ran past me in like this long hair and this like little outfit on, like a suit or something. And I was like, who is this kid? And then another one stopped by, another one, another one. And they're all like weaving between the traffic of people. Mm -hmm. And I just instinctually ran after them. And I, we met up at a crosswalk, and I asked them if they're all brothers and where they're from. And they said, Delancey Street. Of course. <laughs> and I was like, huh? <laughs> Down the street, Delancey Street? Yeah. <laughs> and they're a little bit shy, but then Govinda kind of came forward, and he said, so what is it that you do for a living? And I said, I'm a filmmaker. And, and he got really excited, and he said, oh, we're interested in getting into the business of filmmaking. So it really just started as a friendship. You know, we had this similar love for the cinema, and I'd show them cameras and we'd hang out. And yeah, I, I had no idea what their backstory was at that point. So at that stage, were you just were they just asking you tons of questions, and you were talking about mm -hmm. movies that you liked? And yeah, yeah, it was just it was mainly it was like always just like, you know, Crystal. Every time I see them, a different one, a different brother would come up to me and say. Oh, uh, Crystal, we're just we're just wondering. Um, uh, what's your favorite movie? <laughs> Easy questions then. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And so then, when did the when did you first 
begin to hear a little bit more about how they were raised and what kind of environment they grew up in? Well, I mean, at, at first I, I found out that they're homeschooled and I grew up, you know, my, my cousins were homeschooled and I knew other kids. I was like, okay, you know, they had a different type of upbringing. I can respect that. And then I think, I think like maybe seven months in, Govinda said, oh, you're our first, you're our first friend. You know that you're our first friend. I was like, okay, they must have been, you know, isolated a lot more than I realized. At that point, I knew that I had to be very um, careful with the story and mindful. And but also, I I think at that point, I really just felt like this is something that I had to pursue. And so, when did they actually allow you into their personal space and into their apartment? And what was that experience like for you? It was like five months or so that they allowed me into their um, into their home. It was just like a very organic process, us getting to know each other. And I mean, I was like pretty much in there when I found out more like what the backstory was. Mm -hmm. So I was already filming, already hanging out, and I thought that it was gonna be some sweet film about these kids trying to make a movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I was gonna like capture that, you know? Yeah. But it became so much bigger than that. But they were really happy to talk to you about their relationship with their dad? It took a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't want to talk about it for a long time. Yeah. But when they started, you, you can almost like see them opening up. And I think it's just like, you know, as you know, just talking about things, it helps. The access you had to the home footage was incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and that they willingly offered that up to you. Like, how did you start to piece together their childhood through that home footage? You know, a lot of the home footage was birthdays and just random, random shooting. There wasn't that much that told too much, but it was mainly just through them talking about it that okay. I was able to um, piece it together. But we definitely, you know, we looked at it like three or four times, all that footage, and we found some stuff between the lines. And was it difficult to gain the trust of the mom and the father in all of this? They trusted me pretty early on. Like, now they look back on it, I can't even believe it. Yeah. <laughs> but they trusted me, and I think there was really more, you know, as far as like they would, re like what they were revealing to me. It took, it took a while for, you know, very pertinent parts of the story to be revealed. Mm hmm especially from the mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But she opened up. So when in the beginning, what was she like? Well, she was just um, unsure. She wasn't, she wasn't doing things on her own terms. And, and then as time went by, she really started to go out and, you know, she started running. She started going out on her own. She's now, you know, ever since she's gone to Sundance now, she's like showing up and hanging out and doing stuff with us all the time. And it's so great. And I think that it really, it's really encouraging for the kids to see their mom a part of it, mm -hmm. because I think that a lot of the pain that they felt when they were younger was, you know, pain for their mother. They are so fiercely protective of her. Mm -hmm. There's that scene in the film where you're talking about maybe going to a proper public school and being schooled, you know, normally, and they and. You know, my response would be like, great, I'm free in the world and experiencing things like a normal teenager, but theirs was like, no, then our mom wouldn't get homeschooling money and yeah, that yeah. was their first instinct. Yeah, no, they loved being, you know, they loved being homeschooled, they loved uh, her teaching them and she was very, she was very, you know, patient with, each, with she was very patient with each of them and kind of like their own needs and... They, they adore her, it's yeah. really sweet. It's really cute, they're there's, incredibly loving. Yeah, there's never any sort of like, no mom or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> they never give her any lip. <laughs> no, they just want her to be around and she's like one of them. Yeah. But I think it's because they're in it together, like they kind of had to survive together. And was it easy to get um, Oscar, the father, to talk to you on camera? Was that something that you had to approach many years into this documentary? I. I did. I did approach it like a couple years into the documentary, but I probably could have approached it earlier if I wanted to because I think that he 
he really wanted to be on camera mm -hmm. and tell the world what he thought. So it wasn't, it wasn't that hard. Yeah. One of the common threads of the film for me is fear. Yeah. One of the lines that kind of sent shivers down my spine was when the dad was like, my power is influencing everyone. And I just froze. It, you know, made me think, well, this guy has real kind of delusions of grandeur or... Yeah. Um, or maybe he's right. <laughs> well, yeah. He is scared of what the outside world is going to do to his children, to his unit, and therefore is also um, pushing that fear onto them. So they're scared too, but then it, what's interesting is that when they actually get out into the world, they seem oddly fearless. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, that's a part of their rebellion. And I think, you know, one of the biggest lessons or, you know, when people love to ask that question, so what's, what do you want people to take away from this? You know, I think if there's one thing that people can take away, and I think that it just naturally comes across is that, you know, fear, you, you can get over fear. And there's, you know, these kids had so much fear installed in them, and they're so resilient, <laughs> and they really moved on from that and just kind of, I feel like once they let go of it, it wasn't even a slow process. They, like, literally are like, they're like, yeah. And they were able to just go out into the world and push for what they wanted. They also had such, um, such a drive to be filmmakers or mm -hmm. just to be out in the world and do stuff. You know, I think if they didn't have that, it would have been a different story. But they had a reason. They like wanted to get out so that they could find filmmakers and learn how to make movies. This is something that's explored in the film as well. He had these kids and he kind of wanted to have his own little kind of army, mm -hmm. right? Which was tied to his Harry Krishna background or not really? I think that it was a mixture of many different little bits and pieces of religions that he was interested in and philosophies. And yeah, I mean, he had like this intention of what he wanted his kids to do and to be. and. I mean, I, he always wanted them to be musicians. Oh. Yeah. There was definitely like a little like Jackson 5 something or other happening there. Okay. As far as like him wanting them to be like musicians and like play in this like kind of like metal cover band type of thing. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, didn't work out obviously. Their yeah. rebellion was, they're like, we want to be filmmakers, you know? We don't, <laughs> right. We don't want to be musicians. I don't know. But I, you know, one time I, I think, this, didn't, this clip didn't make it into the film, but I think their dad was like, he said something like, well, like, you know, like, I was like, oh, do you, do you regret anything or, you know, and he goes, no, why would I? Look where we are now. We're, we're, we're with you, aren't we? Oh, my God. They want to be filmmakers and they're sitting here with you. <laughs> right, which I, which I orchestrated, right? Yeah, wow. He likes to take credit for it all, I guess. Mm -hmm. And as a filmmaker, as a documentary filmmaker, I guess some people's approach is just totally hands off. Um, and I was curious about whether you, you know, would bring new opportunities to them, like going to the beach or taking them to the movies. Was that so that you, you were actually like opening new doors for them as opposed to just kind of filming things and standing back? Yeah, I think that when I first started working with them or becoming friends with them, and they, um, you know, we didn't even know we were doing a documentary at first. It was, it was like, okay, I'm just kind of filming these guys and showing them around. And so I think that maybe I had more of like, you know, I was more of a soundboard for them to, you know, be like, oh, we want to we we go to the beach. And I was like, cool, let's go and I'll film you or whatever it is. Yeah. And... I think that as time went by and they found their, more of their own independence, then I stepped back more. Mm -hmm. Which is funny because within the film, like you can, like a lot of the earlier footage is, you know, I, I shot it more close up and then as time it like expanded, it opened up. These kids are incredible film buffs. They spend a lot of their time watching movies. They write down the scripts. Then they like to film themselves recreating the films. And they make these elaborate costumes out of yoga mats and cereal boxes. What was your response to this incredible output that they put together? When I first came into their house, it was during their Halloween month, which they spend the entire month. month. <laughs> the entire month 
of October getting ready for Halloween and they like build all these different costumes and sets and they you know they they make these candles and it's I mean it's like non-stop every single day and they're very diligent about it and so I I'd come over and they're they're like tearing apart this cardboard and trying to build this big wall this like freezer wall to the kitchen and the, I mean it was it was crazy. They also struck me as incredibly for a group of kids who are homeschooled and who are not really interacting with anybody apart from their family they struck me as incredibly emotionally articulate in a surprising way and I wondered if that was perhaps because they learnt a certain amount of emotional articulacy through watching movies and so they were almost speaking in a language that was yeah. something that they learned through film. Yeah I think I think I think that is that is true um, but with a film like there's always like this narrative and like you know there's certain conflicts that come in and life is very different from that so I think that, yeah, they, they're very articulate and they always were. I was watching footage today of like the first time I met them. Mm -hmm. It was just amazing the way they spoke. It was just little, little Jagadish, like the youngest one who is now Eddie, by the way. Eddie, um, <laughs> yes, they've changed their names. Some of them have changed their names. He was like, I was like, why, do you, why are you interested in cinematography? And he goes, oh, it's, it's just the beauty of things, you know, how it is, how life is. How old is he? He was 11. <laughs> I mean, who says that at 11? Just, I don't know. Um, but I think also their, their mother, um, she, just the way that she looks at life, she's very articulate and really sees things from like a full perspective and I think has like an emotional intelligence that you don't see every day. Mm -hmm. But... Um, and they, you know, they had to endure a lot when they're young. Yeah. And I think that I think that their mom really was the reason why they're okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that. One of the scenes in the film that took me aback was when they were celebrating Halloween and they were just torching some hay casually in their apartment. I was like, fire hazard alert. I mean, were you there filming that at the time or was that home I footage? wasn't, they actually, okay. I mean, I would, they would give me these little presents and it was always very exciting when, the first one was this big stack of VHS cassettes from their childhood and each cassette had maybe 10 hours on them. And I, you know, we look, got to look through all of this amazing backstory of their childhood and uh, that was the Halloween burning of the, <laughs> that was another present. Right. I mean, they would just be like, oh, here, uh, we filmed this. And <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? Yeah. And how would they, like, who curated the films? Like, how did they get hold of the films that they would watch? Um, I think it was a mixture between, like, them, like, watching TV and, like, finding a director they like. And then they tell their dad, and then he'd go get more films from that director. Mm -hmm. They would film movies off television and like have like a whole like like closet of VHS tapes that were you know filmed like horror movies and stuff like that yeah um, and and then when they started going out they just like you know they're at the library they're at bookstores and movie stores and it feels like they are really voracious like when they pinpoint a subject that they like they just really go all in and it's oh, like they do. obsessive. Yeah. There is that line that's in the trailer where he one of the brothers says and then one year we didn't go out at all. I mean that was like a really chilling line. Were you shocked when they I mean that was also only a year ago. Really? Yeah. Okay. Things like still are unraveling, you know? Yeah. They're, you know, f understanding their childhood more. That's like when you feel it in your stomach. Yeah. What's happening with the father right now? Are they still with him? The father still lives at home, and they all kind of just live in the same space together and go about their lives. Didn't one of them move out? Oh, yeah, Govinda moved out. Govinda moved out. Yeah. Okay. And I know that like some of the other kids are trying to move out soon. And where are these kids now? Everyone will want to know. So uh, Bhagavan, the oldest, is uh, working at G 
Jeeva Mukti is a yoga teacher, and he's also a part of this hip hop dance conservatory. Oh. Yeah, and he's doing a lot of like theater and dance and movement. Um, and Govinda, who's one of the twins, second eldest, mm -hmm. he is a camera assistant on you know commercials and documentaries and um, just like short films and stuff. And he just actually shot two films in the last week. One was a feature. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Of his own. They just go for it. Device. Well, he he's like a, a he was a DP on it, so okay. um, he got hired to do it. Um, and then Narayana, he works as um, he's an activist, mm -hmm. and he works at this company called Nyberg, and they're they just won the fracking campaign. Yeah. Wow. So he he, he like goes door to door and tells people what's up. <laughs> How did he get involved with that? Well, he's always been into activism, so he just, you know, started um, volunteering and then eventually led to a job. Mm -hmm. McQuinn is pushing really hard to become a director, mm -hmm. but he's also working at a media company called All Day Every Day and just, uh, you know, learning the ropes. And then Eddie and Glenn are interested in music. Yep. And then all of them, they're starting this production company called Wolfpack Pictures. Okay. And they're going you know, they're starting on shorter projects, which actually is something that they just did with you guys. Mm -hmm. And they're eventually, they're wanting to shoot features, hopefully, at some point. I would really love to see them shoot music videos, too. Yes, I think that that's their next move. Mm -hmm. I think bands would be really into their vision, which is just so unique and surreal, and you just have no idea where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's wild, the stuff they're making. <laughs> I think we should hook that up. <laughs> Let's do it. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad we got to do this five years later. Yeah. <laughs>